Okay, hi everyone. This is Dan Barry from the NOAA Climate Program Office, and uh, thanks for joining for today's webinar. Uh, we're very excited about this webinar. It's part one of, of a two-part webinar. The second part will be held tomorrow. And, um, you know, we all kind of felt that this hurricane season's had an alarming impact on lives, property, and the environment, and um, wanted to communicate what we're doing in response to that in, in this portion of the scientific community. Um, so that sense of alarm that we have motivates us in the scientific community to help try to mitigate the impact of storms like Harvey and Irma um, and other storms that, you know, have occurred during this very active hurricane season. Um, and the way that we do that is through research to improve our understanding, our ability to predict, and our ability to monitor extreme events such as tropical cyclones and their impacts. So today and tomorrow in these two webinars, we're going to focus on a broad cross-section of science that's being done both in NOAA and with partners outside of NOAA. And hopefully in these webinars, you're going to see that uh, there are many scientific issues related to tropical cyclones that are relevant to um, the Climate Program Office, which is where we're located at NOAA. So we're going to hear about a variety of topics over these two webinars, how unusual Tropical Cyclone Harvey was, ongoing efforts to understand and accurately monitor flooding events, new modeling technologies coming along that can help with prediction, efforts that extend prediction capabilities beyond short weather time scales, and also how climate change interacts with events like these two hurricanes in particular. Uh, these webinars are part of a larger series of webinars that we run in the Modeling Analysis Predictions and Projections Program. We've been doing this, uh, this is now our seventh year for this webinar series. And these are the first two webinars of this year's webinar series. Um, it'll run usually through about June. And we hope that you'll decide to come back for more of these webinars. Uh, we're still planning the rest of the series. Um, but we wanted to get these particular topics in as soon as possible while they're still, you know, highly relevant. Um, and there's a lot of attention being paid to the, the topic of these two hurricanes. Uh, you can sign up for our email list on the MAP website, and you can take a look at the archive of webinars over the last six years. We have recordings, YouTube videos, and also slides from the webinars. Um, there are a lot of interesting topics on there. Some of these speakers have actually spoken before on similar uh, topics, and so I encourage you to go and check that out. It's a really rich resource. Our program supports prediction, modeling, and analysis research that's focused on subseasonal and longer time scales. And this webinar series is an opportunity to present research that's funded by the program, as well as to discuss broader relevant research efforts in the community. Today's webinar is going to focus on climate attribution and hydrological impacts associated with these hurricanes. And tomorrow's webinar, which my colleague Heather Archambault is going to host, is going to focus on prediction across a variety of time scales all the way from uh, long weather to um, looking at seasonal time scales. Um, so today we're going to hear from five speakers. We're going to hear first from Adam Sobel, who's at Columbia University, and he's going to talk a little bit about a National Academy's report that came out last year that discussed how to do attribution for extreme events. Um, second speakers and third speaker will be Tom Knudsen and Sarah Kapnick, who are at NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. And they're going to talk about some ongoing NOAA efforts to understand the climate fingerprints that um, are on these two events in particular. Uh, John Nielsen Gammon is the third speaker. He's going to um, he's, he's at Texas A&M University, which is pretty close geographically to uh, where Harvey made landfall and where the precipitation maximum was from that event. Uh, John's also Texas's state climatologist, and he's going to talk a bit about the unprecedented nature of Hurricane Harvey and efforts to monitor. Um, it's precipitation using radar data. Amir Agakuchek, who is at the University of California at Irvine, is going to speak forth, and he's going to talk about um, a unique set of issues along coastal regions where you have um, flooding from precip events as well as um, flooding from um, sea level changes at the coastline, and that's you know in particular relevant for Harvey um, and what happened in Houston. And then our fifth speaker is Yulong Sha from the NOAA Environmental Modeling Center, and he's going to talk about how land monitoring efforts capture events like Harvey and Irma. And some of that work actually is inspired by drought, but here we're going to be talking about the wet side of that work for flooding events. So anyhow, I hope you enjoy the talks today, and you'll come back tomorrow and again for the webinar series. Um, the way we run questions for this webinar series is by using the chat feature. So you can send me a um, chat message. Uh, via the WebEx and let me know that you have a question. You can either type your question or you can just say, I have a question, and I'll unmute your line. And um, please submit your questions early and often because we'll go in, in the order that they're received. So 
Um, feel free even to submit questions while uh, the speakers are talking. Only I will see the chat messages. Um, and so that's about it. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go over to Adam first. So Adam, are you on the line? Yes, I yes, am. Okay, great. I'm gonna transfer control over to your computer, and then you can just share your screen with us and take it away. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. So Adam, if you go into the WebEx window and then the Quick Start tab and then the Share Screen button, we should be able to see. Yeah, I just it just that just gives the option now to click on. So okay, great. See if this works. Um, can you see it? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, take it away. Okay. Right. Thanks, Dan. So this talk is not a presentation of new scientific research. It's a combination of uh, review and opinion. And, um, and I hope it's uh, relevant. Um, so, I, and, and I should say that I think the reason uh, I, I got asked to do this is because I uh, talked a lot to reporters in the media during these events, especially Harvey, and wrote a few things and ended up in a lot of online discussions with colleagues in the scientific community as well. And this talk is really a sort of collection of thoughts based on that as well as um, as well as my understanding from participating in the National Academy study, which I'll describe in a moment. In, in the discussions with a lot of colleagues, um, between me and other scientists, as well as seeing what other scientists say in the media, you hear, see this statement a lot, no one event can be attributed to climate change. This is something we all used to say, some of us still do, and interpreted narrowly in a certain way, it's still true, but it interpreted more broadly, it isn't, and so I want to say some things about that. Um, my understanding of this subject is uh, based on participating in the group that wrote this report that came out um, now about 18 months ago, uh, spring of 2016, Attribution of Extreme Weather Events in the Context of Climate Change um, by the National Academy of Sciences. And, and this report, like other, all the other academy reports on every other topic, is really just a review of the primary literature. Um, so, uh, but it, as you can tell from the title, uh, to say we can't attribute events to climate change is, is not uh, strictly true because now there's a whole field of science that does exactly that, although how does, how it does that is um, maybe a little more complicated than uh, the most naive uh, understandings might indicate. But, but, you know, this field has come a long way in the last 10 years, and so I wanted to say something about it. This, um, the question is, what is attribution? I think most of you listening probably know this, but it, you draw the explicit connection between climate science as a whole and individual events. So the attribution science tries to say something about how a single event has something to do with climate change, or doesn't, depending on what the answer is. It's about quantifying the, the contributions of different causal factors to an event. Climate change is one of those causes. And a typical attribution study calculates how much climate change, or any other factor, but climate change is one we're interested in here, has affected some event's magnitude or its probability of occurrence. Um, and so this was our task. I'm going to go through these sort of introductory slides very quickly. Um, but it was to examine the science uh, of doing this assess our understanding, how well can we do it, provide guidance about how robust the answers are, and identify future research priorities, uh, the last of which I won't say anything about. Um, this was the group. I don't want to dwell on it. It was chaired by Dave Titley. I'll just say there's a few people in this group who actually do attribution and are experts on it. The rest of us, including me, weren't. Uh, I don't, don't do attribution studies, at least at this point in my career, but we worked in related areas. But, you know, as, as um, what I've learned is once you're on one of these panels, then you become visible and you get asked about it by reporters and all of a sudden people think you're an expert. Um, so what factors influence an extreme event? Any extreme event has many conditions going into it. Uh, and, and every event has a host of possible causes and usually multiple actual causes. So every event, it's just by nature of the fact that it's extreme, it has to have something to do with large-scale circulation, the internal modes of variability, the specific weather pattern. A lot of things have to line up to make an event extreme or wouldn't be extreme. But human-caused climate change and other human factors, such as land use, can also play a role. Uh, I think this much is, uh, is well-known and, and obvious. Um, one thing we try to emphasize very much in this report, and that comes up again and again in every conversation, is that you, 
can't answer the question of whether climate change caused a particular event, full stop. That's a, just an ill-posed question. The answer will never be yes and, and often shouldn't be no either, but it's just a bad question. Natural variability is almost always a factor. Maybe always would be a better statement. So we don't ask the question, was this event caused by climate change? When reporters ask us, we try to change the question. So better questions are, are events of this severity becoming more or less likely because of climate change, or to what extent could this storm have been more or less intense because of climate change, given other factors going into it being equal uh, in two different climates. So just to say a couple of slides worth about how this is done, um, there's some methods that are primarily observational, and this is an example from one study, which was a very cold winter in Europe. And it, uh, you can do it from observations if the observations are good enough. Um, so in this case, there was uh, this cold winter went with a certain circulation pattern with high pressure over the continent. And what these researchers did, the, the references is, is list the, the, the first author in the year listed there, they looked at historical events that had the same circulation pattern, more as well as within some tolerance, uh, historically and in recent years, and then how different are the temperatures given the same uh, pattern. So that's trying to isolate the role of thermodynamics and, and greenhouse gases. And there's some difference, and so the authors attribute that to the human influence. Um, this kind of thing can be done for kind of events where the observations are good enough and the link to uh, temperature, which is the primary variable directly influenced by greenhouse gases, is direct enough. For some kinds of events, this kind of appro approach can't be done. Um, the more broadly used approaches involve models, and the basic idea is that uh, we have some model that can simulate the events of interest um, and then uh, can also simulate climate change. And um, you run a real-world simulation of, say, many years, and you see how often that event occurs, and then you do it again with the human greenhouse gases removed, uh, and you see how different is the probability of the event occurring. So the thing shown here is a flood in the UK. And um, what's shown are so-called return period curves, or the, the, the it's a net stream runoff is what's plotted on the y-axis versus the occurrence frequency, the inverse of which is return period uh, logarithmic scale on the x-axis. And the um, blue line in each case is from a model uh, uh, estimate uh, using the current climate. And then the other estimates, and these are from four different models in the four panels, are from different calculations of a pre-industrial uh, control without human influence. And the observed uh, level is the black line going across. So in all these simulations, to differing degrees, the simulations with the real current climate and the real greenhouse gases yield a, uh, a shorter return period, a higher probability of this flooding event than, um, than would have happened pre-industrially. And this is the, sort of the basic idea. There are other approaches that are more highly conditional. Um, I won't go into the, all the different ways this is done with coupled models, atmosphere only. Uh, using specified SSTs is always an issue because you have to decide how you're going to specify them for the, for the, um, you know, the, the, the pre-industrial uh, world. How you're going to take out the greenhouse gas emissions is always an issue. So I will say something about highly conditioned simulations. This is a way that's not, not shown here in the slide where you basically run a weather forecast for a short period of time. You put in the initial conditions, like make Hurricane Harvey happen, and then you change the initial conditions just thermodynamically, like reduce the temperature uniformly in some way that you get from, say, climate model simulations, but keep the same, uh, you know, dynamics in the initial conditions and see then how what's the change in intensity or other characteristics of the storms. This is an approach that's more accessible for some kind of events that are hard to simulate in low-resolution uh, climate models. Um, some events are more attributable than others. We can do this very differently for different kinds of events. It's the most reliable when there's sound physical principles involved. In other words, we understand the events and how they're related to climate. When we have evidence of a trend in long-term observations, that's always increases our confidence. And if we're using models, then we want to believe that they can simulate the event well. And so all these things have to be examined when you look at any attribution study. Um, some events are more attributable than others to be more specific. We have the highest confidence, I think it's safe to say, in how well we can attribute extreme heat and cold events. Hydrological drought, which includes the effect of evaporation on soil moisture, um, is maybe the, the next most and heavy precipitation events because the um, Temperature effect on water vapor is so strong. Our next, at the bottom of the list, severe convective storms like tornadoes and hail and extratropical cyclones, we have little confidence in our ability to attribute those, either because of data issues or because the, what the climate effects even should be are not clear. 
Hurricanes are somewhere in between. Um, they're challenging, but I think they're coming into range. Uh, starting to, we're starting to see a couple, and I think we'll see studies on Harvey and Irma. Maybe we're going to see one in the next talk. Um, I know of at least one other that's in process. So I think it's at the leading edge of what the current methodology can do, but I think it's, we're getting there. Um, this is a, a table we came up with, um, not a table, uh, a graphic we came up with for this report showing uh, so our sort of judgment of how well we can do this, the, the x-axis is some qualitative measure of how well we understand how climate change affects this event, and then the y-axis measures how well we can actually do attribution, which is a function not only of understanding but also of technological things like how good the observations are and how good the models are. We left the upper right corner empty to indicate that every event can get better. You'll see that hurricanes are somewhere um, in the middle as far as understanding and a little below that in terms of attribution ability, I think that represents the limitations of the observational records and the um, need for high resolution models to do hurricanes, as well as um, the fact that we don't understand, especially hurricane frequency as well as we'd like to. If we were just talking about intensity and rainfall though, I would rank it a little higher. So um, I wanna say just a few words here about the effect of climate change on hurricanes, since that's what we're kind of events we're talking about today. And this is just based on a whole bunch of review papers and community reports that are listed there. Uh, so this is my summary of it. And there's one figure from the IPCC at the bottom that I think I won't try to explain in detail, but it shows the expected changes percentage-wise compared to late 20th century uh, for the late 21st century um, for the North Atlantic in several measures of hurricane activity. So, but I think what the, the science says, and we're pretty confident that hurricane intensity, at least of the strongest storm, and definitely precipitation should increase with warming in a warming climate. And this comes from basic physics, um, water vapor for rainfall and potential intensity for, for wind, as well as I think virtually any plausible model, and there's some models that are not plausible for hurricanes, but any model that we take seriously is consistent with this. The frequency of tropical cyclones is currently thought more likely to decrease than increase in the future, at least globally, but that's very uncertain, much more than the first bullet models disagree on it, and they disagree even more when they go to individual basins. I think all things considered, it's reasonably likely that we should expect greater incidence of the most very extreme storms as measured by both wind and rain. I mean, it's somewhat of a competition between frequency and intensity, but I think if we look at the high end of the extremes, we're going to see more, and this is what um, you know, Harvey, and Irma, Harvey and Irma are among the most extreme by some measures. Of course, sea level rise also increases coastal flooding hazard by starting the sea from just a higher level before any storm surge hits, and so that's, um, you know, that's actually a big factor. I'm not gonna talk about it anymore here because it wasn't so much, at least with Harvey, it wasn't the main issue, maybe with Irma to some extent. Um, so there's a lot less agreement, and this comes up in attribution on whether we see these trends that we expect in the future already in observation. Uh, but maybe we don't ask the question right. The, 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 not, to, not to pick on Kostin at all 2013, I think it's actually a very good paper. It doesn't say anything wrong. Um, it looks at trends in uh, several data sets. This is a, a plot showing global trends over the last um, few decades, satellite era, from a, a homogenized data set that the authors made that's supposed to be good for climate studies and take out biases, and it's the trend in each quantile of hurricane activity. So it's, you know, what, how are the most least and average and most intense storms increasing? You have positive trends over most of the upper range, that's at the very top, which is pretty thin. Um, uh, you know, not many storms, just a one or two little quantile. So most of this range we see positive trends, but they're not significant at 95%. The uncertain 95 range overlaps zero, so we tend to say we can't see these trends yet. I think this is um, maybe uh, overly conservative because uh, we, there's a huge amount of variability in, the, in, the, um, in hurricanes year to year, and we uh, wouldn't necessarily expect to see modest trends yet given all that noise. I don't want to explain this paper listed on the right in detail, but it's by Mike Mann and all, and I think it's one of a number of studies out there that's starting to look at this in a different way that doesn't give too much, um, doesn't give so much credence to the null hypothesis of zero trend. If we know the trend we expect, why do we try to disprove a null hypothesis of zero at 95%? Why don't we try to give the best answer that we can based on all the information? So. Um, this is sort of my concluding opinion. Uh, I have two, two slides of concluding opinion, which I'll try to say quickly. I think the standard frequency approach to detection and attribution strongly privileges the null hypothesis of no trend and understates the real extent of our knowledge because we don't really think there should be no trend. So I wonder why we do this. And, and so when I, uh, so I think the case is strong based on uh, physics and 
uh, models and, and other evidence that our future holds more storms like this in the past did, more very extreme storms. Now, exactly how far along we are in that change is debatable, but I think a lot of that is a signal-to-noise issue, given the large natural variability, hurricanes are rare events, the data has problems, um, and that's a big part of the problem. And from the point of view of either mitigation or adaptation, it shouldn't matter that much. I mean, the um, greenhouse gases stay in the system a long time. Decisions we make now have a long time history. To some extent, the same is true of adaptation decisions. We know the direction we're heading, exactly how well we can attribute a storm today. I don't think it's really the critical question. The critical question is what policy decisions we make. And I think if we focus on attribution today, we're sort of missing the big picture. So just to summarize how I approach this when reporters ask me, when answering questions about the relationship between climate change and storms like these, we broke records for precipitation and, um, and wind intensity. In, in Irma's case, it was how long it remained at a very, very high intensity. I try to emphasize that these kinds of events are consistent with what our science predicts will be increasing risks in the warming climate and to validate the very real policy concerns behind it. In other words, when reporters are asking us, they're asking us in part, should we be concerned about climate change? Should we be trying to reduce emissions because of the risks uh, of storms like these? I think the answer is yes. And I try to emphasize that rather than focusing on whether we can um, uh, eliminate the null hypothesis of no trend at, um, at 95%. So as my last comment, I'll just make the analogy. Imagine it was a terrorist attack. The CIA had a few lines of evidence, circumstantial but consistent, that somebody's planning an attack. And then you have a microphone that somebody's been managed to place in a room where the terrorists are planning the attack, we think. But it's a noisy room, and you can't hear what they're saying. So would we focus on that uncertainty and just try to reject an all hypothesis that they're not, there's nothing to worry about, or would we focus on all the other evidence? So I think that, I mean, the attribution studies will be done, and when those are done, we should take them seriously and see what they have to say. But in the absence of those, this is how I go about answering these questions. So I think I'll leave it there. They probably spoke a lot. No, that's, that's great. I was actually perfectly 15 minutes, so thanks a lot, Adam. And I like that analogy at the end that we're commenting in the room here. That's really uh, right on. Um, so if folks have questions for Adam, please uh, send them in via the chat. Again, you can just tell me you have a question, send me a chat message, say, I have a question. Or you can type your question in if you prefer. Um, and Adam, we did indeed, we were watching your uh, conversation on the map list, and that, that was part of the inspiration for inviting you. So you're correct in, in your um, <laughs> uncovering of the reason, yeah. Um, anybody in the room here have a question for Adam? Adam, I think I'll wait a few seconds to see if something comes in via the chat. Sometimes it takes a little sure, while. Sure. Okay, well, I'm not seeing anything at the moment, um, but uh, are you gonna hang on for the rest of the webinar? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. So if anyone does have a question, you weren't able to, to send me a message in time, feel free to still send it, and we can always go back to Adam a little bit later in the webinar. All right, thanks a lot, Adam. Really appreciate it. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna transfer control over to um, GFDL now. So, uh, Dale, are you on the line? <coughs> this is Tom Knutson here. Oh, hi, Tom. How you doing? Fine, thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. So I just transferred control over to the computer in the room there. And um, if you guys can share your screen, that'd be great. Yes, or not. You don't should, you should have it. Have it. In, the, in the WebEx software, if you go to the Quick Start tab and then click Share Screen, we'll be able to see what you guys have up there. Okay, great. So Tom and Sarah, take it away. Okay, thank you. So um, we get a lot of questions from the media about whether climate change playing any role when we have big events like Harvey and Irma. So um, several of us have worked on some um, just putting down our thoughts on how to answer these questions. And uh, this is, uh, I've worked with Sarah and also uh, Marty Hurling on this. So uh, today I'm just going to present some um, um, 
our summary of how we would approach this uh, answering this kind of question. So I'll give the summary at the beginning and then I'll spend the rest of my time sort of going through some of the technical details on uh, why we're saying what we're saying. So, um, so the first thing about uh, the first point is with Hurricane Harvey's record uh, record rainfall totals, these were primarily due to the storm basically stalling over the Houston area. Uh, there's no compelling evidence that we're aware of that climate change is making the occurrence of slowly moving landfalling hurricanes in that region, such as Harvey, either more or less likely. Now, Hurricane Irma was an exceptionally intense storm. It likely set a global record for the satellite era as the longest duration that a, that a tropical cyclone has maintained surface wind speed of at least 185 miles an hour. In terms of attribution, there is indirect evidence at least that the severity of, of some hurricane impacts, especially uh, storm surge levels and rainfall rates, are being increased by anthropogenic climate change through increased sea level and atmospheric moisture. Um, this, uh, I think uh, Adam was also mentioning these effects of sea level rise and moisture. However, increased um, hurricane surge levels and hurricane rainfall rates have not been clearly detected in the observed climate data. So this is that, uh, that null hypothesis. Are we seeing a, a clear trend at the, at the say that the, uh, the, where we can reject a null hypothesis of 0.05 level? Scientists expect that hurricanes will become more intense on average, this is based on our model simulations, in the Atlantic and globally as the climate continues to warm. But there's at present no clear observational evidence to date for this, uh, for this connection. Climate change is also expected to increase the global frequency of very intense storms like Harvey, Irma, and Maria in the future, but quantifying the effect remains difficult and there's only low confidence for such an increase in the Atlantic Basin. So these are our summary points, and now I'll try to cover uh, some of the background behind these as we go forward. So um, I do think it's important to look, when we're talking about climate change effects on hurricanes, to look at the data to see if we see uh, trends emerging in the data um, in long-term records. So these are uh, some normalized indices of Atlantic hurricane activity and related indices. We see global, the top curve here is global mean temperature. These are all five-year running means. So that shows a very cl uh, clear uh, rising trend, significant rising trend over time, similar to what we see in the tropical Atlantic where we have a clear rising trend over the, since 1880 a bit more multi-decadal variability superimposed on the, in the case of the tropical Atlantic. Um, when we look at raw hurricane counts in the uh, Atlantic Basin, that also shows a trend. Uh, however, if we look at U.S. landfalling hurricanes, this orange curve here is not showing a, any increase, a significant increase uh, over the century since uh, over the record we're showing here. Uh, now, Gabe, Becky, and I looked at this uh, this discrepancy between U.S. landfalling and raw hurricane counts, and we decided to re-examine the uh, hurricane record to look to see if we thought that this was a complete uh, record or not, or were we missing storms in this earlier part of the record where the record has relatively low counts. And we think, based on a, our a comparison of storm tracks with ship track density that there were not enough ships in the Atlantic to actually observe all the uh, hurricanes that likely occurred back in, the, in these earlier pre-satellite era. So we attempted to make some type of adjustment for this and we came up with this adjusted hurricane count series which no longer really has a significant trend but it has uh, bears more resemblance to the U.S. landfalling hurricane record. Now, this doesn't prove that there's no uh, significant rising trend in hurricane counts, but at least I think it raises real questions about the, the validity of just using the raw data. Um, and so the, uh, to summarize, we would, uh, I would conclude from this that there's really not clear evidence of long-term increases in hurricane, U.S. landfalling hurricane counts, or for that matter, basin-wide hurricane counts in the Atlantic Basin, even though the temperatures are clearly rising, global mean temperature and tropical, uh, tropical sea surface temperatures are rising. Okay, so what about, um, so if there's no 
uh, clear trend in the hurricane activity, what about um, some of the ingredients that came with these events? As Adam mentioned, sea level rise is important. And sea level rise is, is, is one where we have much more confidence that there's a rising trend. In fact, it's gone up about on the order of eight inches or so since 1901. And IPCC concludes that it's very likely that there's a substantial anthropogenic contribution to global mean sea level rise. So we have rising sea level partly attributable, very likely to anthropogenic uh, forcing. And also the projected uh, likely range of projected sea level rise under this uh, high emission scenario for late 21st century is on the order of a half a meter to a meter. This is just the likely range. So substantial sea level rise projected for the future. And of course, uh, models indicate that all else equal when you have a hurricane uh, and in the case of higher sea level, it's going to just lead to higher storm surge levels. There are a number of studies that show this. It's a rather um, clear result. So uh, I guess the answer then was, did climate change have any uh, effect on, does climate change have any effect on hurricanes uh, to date? I think the answer would be yes, uh, all else equal. Uh, uh, sea level rise is leading to, to higher storm surge levels in the hurricanes that do occur. Uh, what about other ingredients? So we have increased sea surface temperatures, not just globally, but also, as I mentioned, in the tropical Atlantic and even in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, this is a map showing uh, the observed trend in, um, in, in, in surface temperature since 1901, so warming pretty much everywhere. And this is the trend we get from CMIP-5 historical runs, again showing warming pretty much everywhere, a pretty bland pattern. And this uh, is an assessment map, a summary assessment map, where we have uh, red colors. That's where the warming trend is both detectable, so it's distinct from natural variability, and also it's consistent with the model. So we have detectable and attributable, at least partly attributable, warming in these red regions, which include these many of the regions where uh, Irma and Harvey and Maria uh, track. So those hurricanes were tracking over regions where we've had detectable anthropogenic warming, at least according to the CMIP-5 model. So one of the ingredients, there are some ingredients uh, that have changed due to anthropogenic climate change. Also uh, atmospheric moisture. So IPCC is concluding that there's medium confidence, that there's an anthropogenic contribution to increase atmospheric uh, specific humidity since 1973. So we have some confidence that atmospheric moisture levels are going up. We see it in the data and it's been attributed in part at least to human uh, anthropogenic forcing. There's also some evidence, at least in land regions, where there's sufficient observational coverage, there's at least medium confidence that anthropogenic Forcing has contributed to a global scale intensification of heavy precipitation over the second half of the 20th century. So rainfall is getting heavier, and there seems to be some, at least medium confidence for an anthropogenic uh, signal there. Uh, they're not saying we don't have the same, we can't say the same thing about um, hurricane precipitation. We, that has not yet been demonstrated to my knowledge uh, in the observed data. We at least have model projections of tropical cyclone rainfall rates. And those are suggesting that hurricane uh, rainfall rates will increase with climate warming, roughly by the same percentage as the increase in the environmental atmospheric moisture. And, and that goes up at about 7% for every one degree Celsius rise in sea surface temperature. I'll show a little bit more on that uh, later. Uh, what about other, so we have these ingredients, sea level rise, warmer sea surface temperatures, more atmospheric moisture. We're pretty confident in those anthropogenic contributions to those. There are some other ingredients where we're not quite so confident about the anthropogenic contribution, even though it can be important for tropical cyclone activity. For example, what about tropical upper tropospheric warming? Now that's something which actually acts to, uh, in our models, actually acts to limit the amount of intensification of hurricanes we get with global warming. Uh, in our models, increased sea surface temperature makes hurricanes stronger, but when we have strong upper tropospheric warming, that moderates that increased intensity. So, uh, okay, so um, in IPCC IR5, they did mention there's uncertainty about the uh, about the this change in in um, 
whether there's been a change in uh, upper tropospheric warming, low confidence in the tropics in particular, in the rate and vertical structure of those changes. Also, uh, there's uncertainty about the Hadley cell. It, it appears to have widened, but the, the magnitude of the widening is very uncertain. So circulation changes are rather uncertain. Um, now here are our tropical cyclone rainfall rates from our simulations. They go up about 10% to 15% on average by the end of the 21st century. This is showing the percentage change in rainfall rates in all different basins. The blue line is what we would expect the increase, percentage increase in rainfall to be just based on this 7% uh, per degree Celsius. And we see that the model's precipitation changes line up pretty well with this 7%. Here in the Northeast Pacific, it's a little more, but, but in general, it's lining up pretty well with the 7%. So more atmospheric water vapor in our models leads to higher rainfall rates. Uh, this is the intensification we see in the models. This is the histogram of maximum wind speed. So we see some, uh, at least a small intensification. It's about 4% on average globally by the end of the 21st century in uh, intensities of storms in a warmer climate. This is based on downscaling, dynamical downscaling simulations. And again, we don't see this uh, clearly yet in the data. This is our expectation of what will happen over the 21st century. Um, we're seeing about a 20, 28% increase in category 4-5 frequency, 35% uh, increase in category 4-5 days globally in our simulations. We see that the changes seem to be biggest here. In the, this is the warm scenario. This is the present day scenario. The changes seem to be biggest here, say, in the Northeast Pacific Basin. In the Atlantic Basin, things are a little bit uh, more complicated because we do see some indication of increases in Category 4 or 5 hurricane tracks in a warmer climate. This is the present day. And these are various warm scenarios compared to the present day. All of them are showing more storms, more Category 4 and 5 than the present day. But the significance levels here are sort of marginal, in some cases not quite statistically significant. So there's sort of marginal significance uh, coming out of our model studies. That's because there's a competition between fewer storms overall, increases of intensity, and it's sort of we get some indication of an increase in the most intense storms. So I'm going to let Sarah finish up here. Thank you for bearing with us with the changeover. Um, so as Adam was saying, in the question of the attribution, in a way it's also an ill-posed question of just, can you attribute this to climate change right now? What do we expect for the future? Because we could actually answer, think about these questions also on shorter time scales. And so one of the um, ways that we've been trying to communicate this um, issue as well after these storms is that there's a lot of work that's being done also on the seasonal prediction of cyclones. So CDPC puts out an outlook for the number of storms in the Atlantic. And, but what we're doing at GFCL that is purely research-based, this is not operational, is right now we're trying to understand and better understand, can we know how many landfalling storms there will be before the storm season even starts? So in the top, we have this 50 kilometer model that has been developed that actually has pretty good ability to understand how many landfalling storms you should expect at the beginning of the season using the dynamic model, coupled model. And we also have another experimental 25-kilometer uh, version um, that similarly has good scale um, for the United States and the Caribbean. So with this, we're actively under trying to better understand what are the time scales that we can also understand how many storms that we should have to build resiliency. Also, um, stepping back from just the hurricane problem, with Harvey, it was an extreme rainfall issue. Um, so last year, there was a study that was conducted by a number of us here that was looking at, um, can you attribute the Louisiana rainfall event, which is in the central Gulf Coast, to climate change? Um, and so this actually, in the bottom left corner of the quadrant that we had, um, pointer, you actually do have a portion of Houston. Um, so we looked at these extreme rainfall events and tried to understand extreme rainfall events in the present climate and the past climate, 
And from our understanding using all available modeling data and observations, is that you actually have an increase in the likelihood of these events. Now, the amazing part of having global climate models that are high resolution that actually get extreme events is you can produce hundreds of thousands of years of data to try and understand what the probabilities of these events are and how they change over time. And only with those really long data sets can you start to have lower and lower bounds um, on the range of your expected changes that you have. So with observations and short records, we have these large ranges of potential for climate change, but with the models, you start because you have more data, you can actually reduce some of your confidence intervals. Now, more importantly, broadly, um, we need to understand how these models capture extremes um, and capture the changes in extremes. So, looking at precipitation as an example, we've used a different suite of different resolutions of models um, at 250 and 25 kilometers as well as looked at seasons of different types of precipitation extremes. So I'm showing here is a five-year returning event and how it changes in our climate change. So from this, depending on the model that you choose, depending on the season that you choose, you either have increases or decreases in the likelihood of extreme precipitation under two times CO2. So it's really important to realize that these changes that we see in our calculations of extremes under different climates relates to resolution and the season. So we need a lot more work to be done to understand why these differences exist and to really look forward, look for um, building models to answer these questions. So we're working on this very actively right now. Um, I know SJ Lynn will talk tomorrow about a vision of the future um, for some of the modeling. But with these questions that we're getting, um, there is um, there is a bit of uncertainty and we need to better address these questions and really address the questions that people are answering in advance of these events as well. Um, so then we have the answers when these events happen. So we have some summary points. Uh, so they're the same from the overall talk. And we can answer any questions now if there's time or we'll wait to the end. Okay, great. Thank you, Tom and Sarah. Um, there is a question. If you give me a moment to bring it up. Bear with me. Okay, let's see. Um, so uh, I haven't read through this question yet, so I'm not sure how it's going to come out. But um, uh, this person asked uh, about the addition of data to the number of hurricanes occurring in the early part of the century because there were no ships to observe them, how did you determine the number of hurricanes to add and what was the justification for that number? Yes, yeah, so that, um, we have a publication, a couple of publications on that in Journal of Climate. It's really just an educated guess. So first we uh, assumed that storms in the satellite era had actually occurred back in the, uh, say, 1900, 1910 era and so forth. And we know uh, from uh, observations, ship tracks over time during that time period. So basically just uh, simulated uh, whether during a storm's lifetime it would have gotten close to, uh, close enough to a ship for the ship to actually have observed gale force winds. And um, so you run, it's basically a simulation and you see how many uh, of these hypothetical storms would slip through the cracks and not be observed given the ship track density, which was fairly sparse over some regions of the open Atlantic. See, the issue is that in the satellite era, we have a very good ability to see um, all the hurricanes that are occurring in the basin. Before, in the pre-satellite era though, we were basically uh, sort of flying blind. Either if a storm happened out in the far uh, reaches of the open uh, waters of the Atlantic Basin, if it encountered land somewhere, then it would be detected. If it encountered some ship by chance, uh, it could be detected. Of course, the ships were, were not trying to encounter storms. They were more likely trying to avoid them. Um, so anyway, the but. So our ability to actually uh, monitor the total amount of storm activity in the Atlantic Basin was limited in the pre-satellite era. And based on our assessment of the 
the, the shipping track density, um, we just don't think there were enough, that the ship track density was high enough to observe all the storms. Um, if we had had, if hypothetically, uh, say, modern year storms would have occurred. So then we we uh, sort of played off all the all the modern era storms against the uh, historical record of ship tracks and built up a, a probability uh, density distribution of the expected number of missed storms, which is just a statistical uh, distribution. And then I'm just reporting we're just reporting the mean of that distribution here. So it is uh, it's a very uh, sort of what if uh, uh, hypothetical uh, calculation, not a precise uh, science. But then after you take what we found and then compare uh, back to the um, U.S. landfalling record, it is at least intriguing that even after all this adjustment, that we basically end up uh, getting back to something closer to what the U.S. landfalling record looks like with our adjusted record. So our hypothesis then is that the actual uh, record of basin-wide hurricane counts is really, in terms of a long-term trend, is more likely to resemble something more like the U.S. landfalling record than this uh, raw hurricane count where we think uh, this earlier part of the record is particularly uh, suspect. And there are, there's some, we have some other indications of that too as well. It turns out that um, a lot of the storms in the latter part of the record were fairly short. We uh, only last less than two days. And we have almost none of these short-lived storms in the early part of the record. That's the kind of symptom you might expect to see if you, if you had a very short-lived storm in the early part of the record way out in the basin. That's the kind of storm you would expect to not to have missed and, and not be uh, in the database. So did, um, does that answer the question? Or uh, I can go into more detail if you like. Hi, right, Tom. Thank you so much for that, that answer. There was kind of a, a related um, question to elaborate a bit on, you know, if you look at the same statistics for major hurricanes or most intense storm activity by other metrics, and Adam touched on it a little bit, but I think, you know, would you be willing to shed you know, some insight from your perspective on that question? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. It's kind of like a, you know, similar to what you were just addressing, but focused on, you know, major hurricanes like Cat 4, Cat 5, or, you know, other other metrics of storm intensity. Yeah, that's that's a great question, because I notice in this uh, series of time series, I'm, I'm not showing any intensity data. I know Adam showed some intensity data going back to 1980 or so. Um, we have some real concerns about intensity too, like our ability to actually monitor the number of category four and five hurricanes out in the open parts of the basin, again, in the pre-satellite era. Um, and I know that, um, I believe his name's Andrew Hagen and Chris Lancey have done some work on this, looking at our ability to actually determine the intensity of a hurricane using observational capabilities uh, of the past. So again, they did some sort of what if types of, uh, of uh, examination of this issue and, and, and conclude that because of changes in our observing capabilities, we did not have the capability of detecting in the open, uh, out in the open Atlantic, uh, something like a category four or five in the same way that we can do that uh, with the modern, in the modern era where we have many more types of uh, measurement platforms that we can rely on. So for that reason, we are very hesitant to say plot a time series of category four, five hurricanes, say going back to 1900. It clearly would have a trend, but we don't really, uh, we don't really place too much uh, credence in the trend in the raw data at this point until until one expends a fair amount of energy in going through and making sure that you're really comparing apples to apples, that what you're look, that the data that you're looking at in the early part of the record can really be compared quantitatively to the data in the latter part of the record. So this is a real challenge for uh, climate science, I think, because long-term records are essential for demonstrating what when we whether we have trends which are clearly different compared to natural variability. It gets back a little bit to this uh, point about the um, 
uh, rejecting the null hypothesis. I think when one can reject the null hypothesis, when one can say that there is a change which is clearly different from natural variability uh, in the climate system and, and it's consistent with what models are simulating, that gives us a lot more confidence in future projections with those same models. So I think, um, I think that this is a very important uh, activity of, of, of looking at the past data and looking for significant trends, looking for evidence of things which are clearly distinguishable distinguishable from natural variability. That's why we have so much confidence, I think, in the projection of future global warming, global mean temperature, because when you look at the past record of global mean temperature, there's a very clear uh, rising trend and it's consistent with models. So we have that detectable, attributable signal and that gives us then a lot more confidence in the future projection than in the case, say, for Category four or five hurricanes, where we can't really rely on uh, having that past record, which is really supporting what we're saying about the future projection. So it leads, I think, ultimately to lower confidence in a projection of, of say, cat, future cat four or five hurricane activity because we don't have the supporting evidence of the uh, clearly distinguishable. Um, long-term trend like we do for global mean temperature. Okay, Tom, thanks a lot um, for, for the answer to that question. And um, I don't have, uh, don't have any other questions. So, you know, thanks, thanks for, for you and, and Sarah to speak today. Um, as Sarah mentioned, there's a talk tomorrow from SJ Lynn and he's gonna pick up a little bit more on some of the GFDL model development and prediction activities. Um, so thank you for that, that plug for, for the talk tomorrow. And uh, thanks both for joining. Okay, the next speaker is John Nielsen Gammon. John, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Great. I just transferred control over to your computer, so if you go to the quick, oh, you beat me to it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> You're a pro. Um, okay, looks great. So take it away. All right. So I'm going to talk about. Um, the exceptional nature of Harvey's rainfall, um, which is of intrinsic interest for a couple of reasons uh, besides scientific. First, uh, uh, weather, weather geeks like myself love uh, record-setting events and keeping track of the statistics of them, but more important societally, uh, we design our cities and infrastructure to withstand uh, events at a certain risk level and uh, events like this that come along, as, as I will show you, have the potential for telling us uh, that we haven't actually uh, designed things as resilient as we thought we had. Anyhow, um, I'm going to use for the, for the rainfall data the uh, real-time daily analyses produced by the River Forecast Centers. Uh, in this part of the country, it's the West Gulf River Forecast Center, which is hosted by the same building as the Southern Region of the National Weather Service. It's a branch of the Weather Service, which of course is part of NOAA. Uh, this is uh, 24 hours ending the morning of August 25th, at which point NOAA was still out in the Gulf of Mexico. It made landfall in the evening of August 25th. Um, I'll just point out the, the color scale is designed to represent uh, fine gradations of rainfall totals ranging from zero to three or four inches, and it gets a bit coarser after that. And uh, that means we can't see very well the extreme intensity of uh, Harvey on these particular maps. This is uh, covering the time it made landfall. You can see most of the intense rainfall was associated with the uh, inner, inner rain bands and eye of Harvey, but there was also some precipitation farther toward the northeast toward Houston. Uh, the next day's precipitation, Harvey had moved inland and was still producing a lot of rainfall near its center, southeast of Austin, Texas. But uh, at this point, Houston was receiving its uh, initial major flooding. Uh, go forward another 24 hours, we still have widespread areas of 10 plus inches of rainfall extending um, across a, a broad swath from west of Houston to Louisiana, which also did get a bit of flooding of their own. 
the next 24 hours, uh, still uh, widespread intensive rainfall in southeast Texas. Next 24 hours, the same thing. And finally, the storm uh, made landfall again in, in Louisiana, is moving off to the northeast. So I'll just uh, quickly loop back and forward again over this so you can get a sense of how uh, not only was it producing 10 inches of rain per day in widespread areas, but because the storm was moving slowly, uh, that was happening in uh, the same location for several days at a time. Um, there's not, uh, as far as I know, um, much work on what makes a, a particular hurricane produce a lot of rainfall wherever it happens to be. But as was mentioned before, one of the key aspects of Harvey was the fact that it moved so slowly so that the rainfall it did produce was occurring over roughly the same area for several days. And while it was on shore, uh, it was still tapping into deep tropical moisture, which uh, uh, also contributed to its ability to produce lots of rainfall even after it had uh, weakened to tropical storm status. Uh, I want to show you an uh, example of maps that uh, we produced. The purpose of this was for monitoring drought. Uh, so this is work funded by NOAA and by the USDA. And the, uh, it's a plot of standardized precipitation index. Negative values indicate drier than normal. Uh, minus one means one standard deviation below normal. Plus one is one standard deviation above normal. And this is where Texas was sitting as of late August in terms of precipitation over the preceding 12-month period. As you can see, for the most part, the eastern half of the state was uh, right around the zero mark. Two weeks later, uh, we had uh, areas of southeast Texas, including Houston and Beaumont, that were in the greater than plus three category, which means uh, uh, the equivalent of three standard deviations above normal, um, which uh, of course, is something that should uh, should happen only extremely rarely, uh, but uh, that's the sort of thing that happened last month. Uh, I think people who are not from Texas have difficulty of understanding the spatial scale of these events. So here I'm showing you the the total rainfall from from Hurricane Harvey and uh, a few days surrounding. The white now corresponds to 20 inches or more of precipitation. And the, um, you see 20 inches or more extending from almost Austin across Houston and Beaumont into Louisiana. Now what I'm gonna do is move that precipitation map over the northeastern United States. And what we see is the area affected is equivalent to the area all the way from Boston to New York City with uh, 20 inches of rain in Philadelphia thrown in for good measure. Um, so this was, um, really an impressive amount of rainfall uh, over a large area. So it's not just the um, highest rainfall total, uh, which is interesting statistically, but also the, since the amount of rain that falls over a, a given area is what produces flooding, uh, I want to examine how Harvey stacks up against uh, previous storms in that regard. So what I have plotted here are my best estimate of the historical 10 most intense rainstorms in terms of average amount of rainfall produced over a 10,000 square mile area over a five day period. Um, and what we see is a few storms that will be familiar to people like the flood last year in Louisiana, which was mentioned earlier, um, the Hurricane Floyd, which uh, hit North Carolina, uh, the top two uh, that I have plotted on this diagram are Hurricane Beulah, which made landfall in South Texas and was also notable for being the greatest tornado producer. And then a storm back in 1899, which uh, produced widespread flooding. We don't have a lot of gauges on that, so the exact value for the rainfall is a bit uncertain. Uh, but I've, I've hidden the, the bar for Harvey, so now let me add you for you uh, Harvey's total. And it is um, uh, literally off the charts. Uh, the average rainfall over the wettest 10,000 square miles was approximately 33 inches, which breaks the previous record by about 50%. Uh, and you can see that uh, um, you generally would break a record by a small amount. It's 
it's quite remarkable how far above previous events this is. Now, of course, I've, I've cherry-picked this. I've, I've picked the most dramatic uh, example of Harvey being a record breaker. So let's actually look at a, a much broader range of durations and area sizes. And in fact, for just about every area you can consider from 1,000 square miles to 50,000 square miles, from two days to five days, Harvey appears to be the new record holder uh, for those Smaller areas, that's definitely true for the central and eastern United States. Um, the larger areas is true for the entire uh, United States. Uh, the one storm that makes it onto this table outside of Harvey was a um, tropical event in uh, Louisiana back in 1940. So you can pick your record, um, Harvey holds it. Here's another plot of uh, what we call depth area duration. So the uh, duration here is five days again. The area is now uh, 1,777 square miles. We get a slightly different listing of storms, but still um, Harvey over on the left is the winner, except uh, in Harvey's case, I have not chosen the wettest 1,777 square miles. I actually picked uh, that number, 1,777 square miles, because that's the area of Harris County, county in which Houston is located. And uh, that's the, the bar that's plotted there. Uh, so the rainfall in Harris County exceeded the rainfall in any other storm over any comparable area that we know of. So in other words, you could have taken the, the wettest storm on record for an area the size of Harris County, had it perfectly target. Houston, and it still wouldn't produce as much rain as Harvey produced. Uh, one way we look, so, so certainly it's going to be an exceptional event, um, but one way we, we design infrastructure that needs to be fail safe, for example, things like dam spillways, which um, need to be able to withstand however much water might conceivably need to be flowing over the dam or around the dam without causing the dam to collapse, uh, engineers use something called probable maximum precipitation, which is uh, it's designed to be, well, it's defined to be the, the greatest amount that's theoretically possible, but uh, atmospheric scientists don't have a theory for how much rain could theoretically fall. So what's done in practice is take the wettest storms ever uh, figure out where they could conceivably have occurred, figure out how much moisture inflow could conceivably have been present, and estimate the upper bound based on that. And this is a plot for probable maximum precipitation over different area sizes for two days and three days. Uh, Harvey is the line with the, with the uh, round dots, and the previously estimated probable maximum precipitation is the squares. And what we see for uh, the three-day total, 72 hours in particular, for a range of area sizes, Harvey matches or even exceeds uh, what was thought to be the probable maximum precipitation uh, in southeast Texas. So in a sense, the rainfall was, was actually inconceivably intense uh, with this event. Uh, Lastly, I want to make a couple of comments on uh, climate change's impact on Harvey. Uh, you, you heard some good um, background on this issue from the previous two speakers. Uh, we don't know uh, whether Harvey's slow motion was affected by climate change one way or the other. There are reasons that would point in both directions, so to speak. Um, we don't know to what extent Harvey's intensity was affected by climate change. Um, and that may have played a role in how long it lasted. Um, but um, we have solid evidence that extreme rainfall has been, is increasing because of climate change in various parts of the world, including the United States. And for me, the null hypothesis is if extreme rainfall is increasing, then we should assume that extreme rainfall in hurricanes is increasing similarly. And we do have model results, as you've seen, that are consistent with that. So with 
Uh, ocean temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico, say, having warmed about a degree Celsius compared to pre-industrial. Uh, we translate that into a 7% increase of rainfall, which, which, by the way, is consistent with what's been observed in Texas for extreme rainfall increases in general. Uh, that 7% looks, like, uh, looks like this on this chart. And there are lots of different ways that this can be uh, interpreted or spun. So, for example, if you ask, uh, was Harvey's rainfall record setting because of climate change? Um, for those aspects we know about, no, it would have been a copious amount of rainfall even without that additional 7%. Uh, was the magnitude affected by climate change? Apparently, yes, for the reasons I described. And again, the estimate here is 7% increase in magnitude. Um, was the odds or risk of an event such as Harvey affected by climate change? I have not assessed that, but uh, I imagine that's going to be a fun question because it, it may be that Harvey was such an unusual event that even um, the folks that do attribution with thousands of model simulations may not actually have an event as intense as Harvey. And when you start getting to the really unusual events, uh, a small increase in magnitude translates into a very large change in the odds. So um, I would not be surprised, for example, if uh, if you translate this 7% increase of rainfall to odds of getting that much rain, it might be more like a something like a, 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 a 10 times or 100 times as likely because of climate change as without it. Um, but ultimately what matters is the damage produced by the storm. And damage tends to increase non-linearly with intensity. Uh, for example, you know, we design most of our infrastructure to be outside the 100-year floodplain. So if you get a flood, even if it's not a, a what we call a 100-year event, wouldn't cause a lot of damage compared to something that exceeds that value. So just for illustrative purposes, I've, I've suggested what a non-linear increase of damage might look like. And from this, it's easy to at least imagine that uh, a small increase of rainfall from a very extreme event can be very impactful. So my take-home message is here, Harvey's rainfall was exceptional by just about any definition of the word exceptional. Um, the flooding was disastrous, primarily because Harvey's rainfall was exceptional. Um, there's talk about, and, and people have written about how uh, development may have contributed to flooding, how impervious soils or, or, or soil that doesn't absorb moisture much may have contributed to the flooding. Those sorts of factors tend to be accounted for in design and assessment of risk. Uh, so if you had some place, for example, that um, had soil which absorbed water directly, that had plenty of reservoir protection, it would still be designed for, to withstand um, rare events but not exceptional events like harving. So Harvey would produce that disastrous rainfall anywhere there were, was infrastructure to impact. Uh, and as I mentioned, in an important sense for public safety, Harvey may have produced more rain than was thought to be possible. And in that sense, um, we're already at probable maximum precipitation with Harvey, and as temperatures continue to rise, including sea surface temperatures, scientific expectation is uh, extreme rainfall amounts will continue to rise also, which means we're getting new possibilities for uh, what uh, sort of flooding events, what sort of rainfall uh, the atmosphere is capable of producing. Uh, so that's all I have, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thanks, John. That was really very interesting. Uh, for folks on the line, again, send a chat message. Let me know if you have a question. I can unmute your line, or you can type your question in. I haven't received anything yet. Is there anything in the room? Anyone have a question in the room for John? I think while people mull it over, uh, John, I was wondering if you have information on the rainfall rates and whether those were unusual within some of the bands, some of the really heavy bands that came through in Harvey. Um, we saw rainfall rates of, I think, up to six inches an hour, which in, in lots of places would be really impressive. Uh, but we had a, a storm in October of 2015 near Austin that produced a, a nine inch per hour rainfall rate. So Harvey wasn't off the chart so much for the, the rate of rainfall. It was just a, 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 a relatively 
large rate of rainfall occurring over the same place for a long period of time. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I haven't seen anything come in through the chat yet. Anyone in the room come up with a question for John? Okay, John, are you going to be able to hang out for the rest of the time? Yeah, sure. Okay, so if there's another question, maybe I'll come back to you. And, and if you're online typing, just let me know. Oh, you know, actually, somebody just somebody just popped a question in. Okay, so um, let's see. This question is, from a meteorological perspective, can you discuss the lack of any steering winds that might have picked RV up from the Gulf and moved it inland? Sure. Uh, so um, in, in normal circumstances, climatologically, uh, storms by – and we're making landfall in Texas. They obviously tend to be moving toward the northwest because of the coastal orientation. And then they'll tend to move toward the north and toward the northeast with time. Um, the northward component um, is, is partly background winds and partly what we call beta drift, the fact that the hurricane itself is affecting its environment and will, will automatically uh, Tend to tend to move away from the equator in the absence of anything affecting it. Um, in the case of Harvey, we had uh, in the jet stream a ridge over the western United States and a trough over the eastern United States, so that the um, the, the middle tropospheric winds were from the northwest, weak from the northwest, which, um, as it happens, was was just enough to cancel out the tendency of Harvey to drift to the northwest in the absence of wind. And let me let me use that as a jumping off point to just expand briefly on whether climate change affected Harvey's motion. Um, one reason for suspecting that climate change might have made Harvey more likely to stall is is research which is still somewhat controversial, but indicates that uh, summertime jet stream patterns are becoming more likely to be locked into place and, and be stationary, which would allow for, uh, say, stalling winds to persist for a longer period of time if that research is correct. But on the other hand, you, you, you heard earlier that um, the tropical belt is expanding northward which uh, one measure of that is the jet stream position on average is farther north, which means that in that sense, climate change is making the jet stream less likely to interact with a storm that's at the latitude of say 25 or 30 degrees. So that's why I say that the impact of climate change on Harvey's motion is, is even, the, even the direction of that impact is not clear. Okay, hey, thanks, John. That was an interesting answer. There was a, another question that came in that's on a little bit of a different track, um, but this person is wondering uh, whether in your role as a state climatologist, um, do you feel that you'll be able to play a role in helping communities impacted by Harvey move forward with resiliency measures? Yeah, I certainly hope to be playing a role in that. Um, for starters, I'm going to be working on um, sharing information on the, the wide range of uh, rainfall data collected during Harvey, including by just private citizens that send in data to Weather Underground or Kokoraz or that sort of thing, so that we can really pin down uh, the rainfall totals as exactly as possible, which in turn will enable uh, the hydrologic models to simulate flooding as, as accurately as possible and, and be able to thereby represent future storms and, and future possibilities accurately. Uh, beyond that, another interesting question, of course, is um, the, the future trend of extreme rainfall. And Houston itself has experienced several floods in recent years. And some preliminary work I've done indicates that the trend in Houston is much larger than the trend in most other parts of Texas. And, uh, you know, you could hypothesize that maybe it's because of the big city, but we don't see the same trends in the San Antonio or Dallas. You could hypothesize, well, maybe it's being close to the coast, but we don't see the same trends in other coastal locations. So that seems to be basically bad luck in a sense, um, or natural variability, as scientists prefer to call it. 
Um, but that is important going forward because you, if, you, if you're predicting extreme rainfall to increase and therefore flooding susceptibility to increase, you have to say increase relative to what? And we need to figure out what's the appropriate baseline, what's the appropriate reference period given that extreme rainfall historically has been so variable. So that's another issue I hope to look at. There's uh, one question here in the room from Anarita. Anarita, go ahead. Uh, hi, I was just wondering whether you looked at other aspects of uh, circulation associated to Harvey, and in particular whether you had looked at uh, like wind gusts and whether there was any, anything exceptional there that could have added to you know the impacts of rainfall. Uh, no, I haven't looked at uh, the winds uh, in particular. Um, one thing we're going to be uh, trying to pin down for the rain gauges, for example, is whether they're mounted uh, in, a, in a level fashion because the prevailing wind direction for several days was from the northeast and the southeast because of the storm. So a gauge tilted toward the east would potentially pick up uh, a foot more rain than one that's slightly tilted toward the west. So the, the wind is, go is going to affect uh, the measurement on the one hand. I don't know to what extent the, the wind caused the rain except for the fact that there was clearly um, let me go back to the rainfall map. There's clearly a connection between the rainfall distribution and the coastline. Uh, winds coming from from water to land experience an increase of surface friction, and so there's convergence at the mm -hmm. coast. And so I would imagine that the the fact that we had onshore flow going on, in addition to being able to bring in uh, and replenish the moisture. Uh, was also causing there to be locally enhanced rainfall because of that frictional effect. Okay, great, John. Thanks for fielding so many questions as well. Um, there was one more question that came in, but I think in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. And if we have a little bit of time later, maybe I'll come back with that, if that's okay with you. Okay, sure. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, John. So next up is Amir Agakuchak. Amir, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah, you're a little bit uh, muted. I don't know if you can maybe get closer yeah. to a microphone. Is it better now? Yeah, it's a little bit better. Yeah, thanks. And then um, in WebEx, you should go to the Quick Start tab, and then there should be a share screen button there so you can show us your slides. Can you see my slide? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Amir. All right, so uh, today I'm going to talk about um, coastal flood risk analysis, uh, considering multiple drivers, ocean and uh, terrestrial or fluvial flooding. Um, and this is about a paper that uh, came out on the day um, um, Houston got flooded. So in coastal areas, you know already that there are multiple drivers. The two key drivers are um, surge, basically ocean drug, uh, flooding, and uh, you know hurricanes involve a lot of rain, so you get also inland flooding, and they interact the coastal areas. And the higher the sea level or surge, uh, the smaller will be the um, um, the gradient between uh, fluvial and ocean water level, and the higher will be the backwater, and of course, more flooded areas, more inundated areas, uh, you know, you, you, you expect. Um, but how do we handle flood risk now in coastal areas? So if you look at USGS guidelines, you know, we fit a distribution function, typically log Pearson type 3 to stream flows, and we create curves like this, flood frequency curves. And we have also guidelines for ocean flood analysis from FEMA and other places, and even you feed it GEV distribution to ocean water levels. And again, from that, you um, do sort of frequency analysis on, um, you know, total water height, um, or, or even surge or combine. Um, but in both cases, we ignore the interactions between the two drivers. 
again, we know that physically the two are related, um, and we understand the relationship. We can even model that using high resolution flood models with ocean boundary conditions. But when it comes with, with when it comes to formal flood risk analysis, um, then um, you know we kind of ignore the interaction between the two. So the goal of our study was to come up with a way to handle this sort of compounding effect of ocean and terrestrial flooding. Um, so a quick definition of compound events, and this um, definition comes from IPCC mainly and two follow-up papers. Um, when you have two extreme events happening at the same time, or you have two non-extreme events that happen at the same time, but they have an extreme impact. So you can have, let's say, moderate flooding, uh, terrestrial flooding, moderate ocean flooding, but when they happen together, it can lead to extreme impact in coastal areas. The same with droughts and heat waves and many other you know, events that have multiple drivers. So basically considering events with multiple drivers, but there are different types of them. Okay, now, um, in, in our study, we looked at um, different major basins um, and we looked at this compounding effect and trying to understand the relationships and how the flood risk will change if you consider multiple drivers. Um, so when you want to look at multiple drivers, you need to have um, a kind of definition for hazard. There are many different types uh, already in the literature. For example, the left one is known as the Kendall hazard scenario where you have a threshold. You have two drivers, in this case, let's say discharge on the x-axis, water level on the y-axis. Um, you need to have a hazard scenario um, and then you do sort of frequency analysis on values that exceed you know, a critical threshold. On the right, there is um, what we call it the or hazard scenarios where you have two thresholds. Um, do you see my cursor? We do. So, yeah, so this is, let's say, your water level threshold, which is critical, let's say, uh, seawall level, and this is um, a critical threshold for discharge, and anything that exceeds above, you know, is a critical event. And this is usually, it's called or hazard, and it's used when one driver alone can cause problems. And this is the case usually in the uh, coastal flooding, you know, Either one can cause, you know, serious flooding. So we went with the or hazard scenario, and we thought a lot about how to communicate this type of um, risk information. Uh, John mentioned um, engineers and design uh, guidelines. In in uh, in engineering design, we use this um, notion of failure probability, and it is mainly used in a kind of univariate sense. Um, and here is the univariate equation for failure probability. Um, and T is design lifetime. Let's say you're building a levy for 50 years or 100 years. And T is probability of occurrence. Um, um, and you know, that gives you, you know, probability of failure. Failure doesn't necessarily mean physical failure. Let's say you have a levy and you don't want the water to get more than 10 feet from the base. Um, because that's your, let's say, freeboard threshold. Any exceedance above that, it's called failure, even if it doesn't lead to physical failure. So um, um, in, in our study, we sort of extended the um, failure probability, what is used mainly for one hazard at the time, to a kind of multivariate, multi-hazard scenario, where you have multiple drivers. In case of coastal flooding, two drivers, ocean and terrestrial flooding. So this is the general equation, and this C is a multivariate model. You need to combine two different drivers. So conceptually, this is how it works here in this figure. You see that um, if you have um, one single um, hazard, let's say terrestrial flooding, and uh, you do sort of frequency analysis with USGS guidelines for a particular structure, you will get a curve like this. And the y-axis is failure probability, and the, the x-axis is design lifetime, 30 years, 40 years or so. And the bivariate cases where you have multiple drivers, 
um, uh, in that case. And I mean, in our study, I'll, I'll present some um, some results for different locations. We also consider sea level rise um, for the failure of probability analysis. Imagine if we get the same event in the future, the same sort of terrestrial flooding, the same amount of precipitation and surge, but sea level is, let's say, two feet higher, the flood uh, will be worse, a lot worse in coastal area, of course, right? So we wanted to also be able to account for the effects of sea level rise uh, in this sort of compounding flood analysis. So um, here, here are some results. On the, on the top left, you will see this sort of conceptual um, figure for this sort of or hazard analysis or, <coughs> sorry, compound extreme analysis. And um, you have some observations, these are the dots, and, and you have here the, the, the blue dashed line here is 20 year coastal flood levels. So it's sort of, let's say this is a kind of a, a somewhat extreme threshold and 20, 20 year um, fluvial flow. Again, these two are not that extreme, but it's still, uh, you know, relevant for drainage and design and so forth. And um, the uh, red line here is the corresponding bivariate 20 year extreme event that you consider two events and areas A, B, C are areas that we are interested in. So exceedances above these two red and green lines are, are sort of critical events for us. Now, if you look at these, are, these three figures are for different locations. Um, the first one is Philadelphia, the second one uh, San Francisco, and third one is Washington, D.C. So if you look at this one, for example, um, again, this is 20-year uh, water level um, event, and this one is 20-year terrestrial flooding or fluvial flooding. And you can see, if you look at the, the intersection, the or hazard scenario tells you, if you consider the compounding effect, that this point is a 13-year event. Although, uh, again, if you treat, if you look at the univariate case, you know, you're looking at 20-year event. So this um, indicates that uh, if you consider multiple hazards, the um, the, the event will is, is more likely to happen. In other words, what you consider as 20 year event, when you consider the compounding effects can happen, you know, on average once in every 13 years. So it's, um, it's almost twice more likely, almost a um, little less than that. <clears throat> so, um, this is a way to account for um, multiple drivers. And depending on the relationship between coastal um, water level and uh, terrestrial flood data, this relationship could be weaker or stronger. So in case of Washington DC, for example, univariate 20 year event corresponds to, sorry, uh, 16 year, um, compound extreme events considering the interaction between two different drivers. In, um, I don't want to go through all the details. In the, the paper that's available on my website, there is a 70-page long um, supplementary information with different definitions. There was an independent assumption um, that, in, that we have included. I don't want to go through all the details, um, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. And about the sea level rise, um, again, we did this analysis for different places using first univariate, let's say just a terrestrial flooding, looking at failure probability on the y-axis and lifetime in the x-axis. Okay. Um, we looked at the uh, compound extreme event or or hazard scenario, the red line, and almost in all cases, the failure probability increases when you consider multiple drivers. Again, this is what we expect, but um, we try to put numbers on this sort of compound events and how they change the risk of failure in coastal areas. And then the sea level rise, once you have the model, then you can use a different sea level rise projections and see how the uh, coastal flooding um, changes considering different sea level rise scenarios. In this case, uh, Washington, D.C., the purple line here 
is using uh, sea level rise scenarios from Kof et al. that consider um, you know future projections and also uh, correct for local land subsidence um, and things like that. So this means that um, even if we don't consider uh, changes in current terrestrial flooding, if you just add future sea level rise scenarios, the failure probability increases significantly. So the, uh, the purple line, uh, the solid line, is from the median of future simulations uh, centered around 2030, and then uh, the two dashed lines are the 5 and 95 percent um, bounds. So this framework allows you to consider um, changes in flood risk considering different sea level rise scenarios. So we've done this for different locations around the country. Uh, this one is the top left is Houston, Texas. Um, and you can see that there is a big difference between univariate and bivariate case. This indicates that the, uh, the compounding effect, the interaction between the two drivers um, is actually pretty significant. And then you add a sea level rise, again, that increases more. And one more thing, again, you see in some cases failure probability reaches to one. Again, it does not mean physical failure of whatever you're designing or a water level you're considering. It means that it's, it's, it's likely that it will exceed that particular threshold, whatever it is, in this case, 20-year event, 20-year compound event. So uh, in summary, uh, concurrent coastal flood frequency analysis, uh, sorry, current coastal flood frequency analysis does not really address this sort of compounding effect, multiple drivers, and we believe it is really, really important if you want to provide reasonable coastal flood risk information. And uh, if we go with the current univariate methods, we may underestimate the risk of flooding. Um, and still, we believe there are research gaps. Uh, in, in our paper, we, we propose a sort of theoretical model to address terrestrial and coastal flooding, but still there is theoretical gap um, for detection and frequency analysis of compound events. In some cases, there are more than uh, two drivers. We need more development in this area, and, and there are many different types of compound events that happen in different scales. We have drought and heat waves and many more. And um, in addition to that, John also mentioned development and human activities like urbanization. Um, they play a role, and they can also have this kind of compounding effect, but it's not easy to bring them in flood risk analysis, and that requires um, a lot of research. That's what we're doing right now. Um, and if you're interested about the theory and the method, it's available. If you've, you've used this multivariate popular analysis toolbox, it's available on my website, the source code. And these are the two developers. And there is a paper that explains um, um, model fitting and you know, all the theoretical um, part, theoretical analysis. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have about um, our study. Great. Thanks, Amir, for going through this uh, recent paper. Um, so if there are questions from the um, online attendees, please send a chat message. Uh, some people have also been using the Q&A feature. That's fine as well. Um, any questions here in the room? Amir, I was wondering whether, I know this is these are really new results, but whether you've socialized this at all with um, decision-making communities, engineering communities, just because the implications of these different thresholds are significant for um, for investments in infrastructure? Um, yes, we're talking to um, decision makers and uh, infrastructure managers. Uh, we started with uh, energy infrastructure. We were talking to natural gas, uh, SoCal natural gas, and uh, you know they have a lot of facilities in coastal areas, and uh, we are doing this type of analysis for them, updating their risk um, for different type of infrastructure they have. Um, we have a project funded by the state of California uh, to look at some critical locations, um, and uh, but we are planning to do that more 
um, talk to more and different different types of sectors and get more feedback. Okay, great. Thanks, Amir. Um, I haven't seen any other questions come in via the chat box or via the Q and A section. But if anything else comes comes up, um, I'll come back to you and, and ask. So thanks for the interesting presentation. Okay, next speaker and final speaker is Yulong Sha. Uh, Yulong, are you on the line? Okay, Yulong, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, Yulong, I just transferred control over to your computer, so if you can click the Quick Start tab and then great. Oh, I need to. Oh, I I need to share my second screen. Yeah. Can you? Can you give me, okay. Let so me just bring the file up on your screen that we'll yeah. be able to. Yeah, I need to go green. This is share, stop sharing, and you give me, and then I need to share my second, okay. Yeah, do you have your slides then? Uh, oh, great, yeah, okay. Yeah, And Perfect. then I can slide this. So, okay. Great. Okay, okay. go ahead. Yeah. I'm Yulong Xia from the NSF EMC. I mainly work for the Airbus project. And uh, as uh, Dan told, told you, and uh, I'm working for Airbus, the main purpose is for the drought monitor. But now we look at the Airbus um, monitor to uh, look at the opposite case for the hurricane Harvey and Irma on flooding effect. Okay, and uh, if if you look at the bottom, this shows the street uh, street view in Texas. Houston, you can look at this is the before uh, before Harvey and after Harvey. After Harvey, you look at the almost everywhere is flooding. Okay. And uh, here, this slide gives you a briefing about Hurricane Harvey. You can look, this is a uh, picture from the bank's uh, email. You can look, it's, uh, it's larger. And uh, this table show you some place, like uh, John shows. This is uh, shows about uh, 64 inches. OK, this is uh, four or five days uh, period. This is very high. The maximum rainfall for four days period, uh, some place is larger, but one thousand millimeter. It's about a meter. The, this is the wettest tropical hurricane, brought heavy rain, and uh, caused uh, catastrophic uh, flooding. This shows uh, this caused uh, eight three people died, and. Uh, Cause the 70 billion US dollar damage. Okay. And uh, here show you the uh, initial condition for the soil moisture condition before Harvey landing. You can look, this is, uh, I show the top shows the top one meter soil moisture normally for three days, and the bottom shows the total column soil moisture normally. You can look for this slide. This is the region, East Texas and Louisiana region. It's basically from, if you look at the initial condition for soil moisture, is white. Okay. And uh, this is a white situation. And also, if you look at our stream flow, it normally shows largely positive. This means if a highway precipitation occurs, flooding will be expected. Okay, and uh, this slide shows a movie about uh, the daily anomaly for precipitation, uh, soil moisture, and the runoff, and the stream flow. You can look uh, when how we come and uh, and uh, then uh, brought uh, the heavy rain, and then they they bring the uh, soil is saturate. And then produce the total runoff, not total runoff, through the river channel, go go to the stream flow. 
This basically the air dust look is generally capture the uh, the hydrology process from the uh, the rainfall eventually go to the stream flow and uh, and because extremely heavy rainfall and relative wet source uh, soil cause uh, catastrophic flooding in this region. Okay. And uh, this slide show you the past harvey uh, the impact, and the top shows the soil moisture percentile, and the bottom shows stream flow percentile daily. You can you can look when harvey after harvey, and the soil wetness will continue one to two weeks. You know this is a recover to normal, and if you look at the uh, stream flow normally. You can look uh, large stream uh, flow a percentile will continue about several days, and then from the uh, stream wet to the uh, wet case. And uh, this slide show you about experimental real air and the fourteen generation. We, because our current operation air does mainly work for the drought case, the, I, I know even we have the moderate effect for the drought monitor, but still is not a very, shows a very important. But if you look at the flooding case, the real time is very important. We use the CTC gauge precipitation, stage two precipitation, and uh, even name V4 forecast precipitation, as well as uh, the name V4 analysis and forecast data include uh, the radiation at the center. And we extend uh, now CDAS data to achieve real time air dust system. This shows uh, that we use uh, different sources hold how to achieve real time air and dust. And here shows the uh, operation air and dust and the experimental real time air and dust. Top, you can look at the operation air and dust, and the bottom, you can look at the real time air and dust, the daily stream flow anomaly. You can look if we use real time exactly in the August 27th, we can find the flooding case. Okay, but if we use the operation air dust, because we have four days behind, even we need to capture four days and then get the uh, real, uh, get the flooding case. Okay, this shows uh, time uh, timing has a larger impact for the monitoring flood situation. And now we go to the hurricane Irma. Irma is another story. We have stronger wind and uh, less heavy uh, rainfall when compared with the Harvey. Okay, because Harvey take uh, the long duration and then with very heavy rain. Uh, and also Harvey, uh, the Irma caused about 101 total uh, people died and uh, also caused uh, about uh, six two billion U.S. dollar damage is both the major hurricane. Okay, and if we look at the soil moisture condition on 9th September, you can look at top shows the top panel shows the top one soil moisture normally, and the bottom shows the total column soil moisture normally. Okay, left just shows daily. And the right shows the past week average. You can look in the Florida and uh, uh, Georgia and South Carolina. Basically, this is the situation is dry. Okay, if you look at the soil moisture, look is dry even from top to bottom. Okay, and this shows a movie the about the daily. Precipitation anomaly and the total column soil moisture percentile and the daily runoff anomaly and the stream flow anomaly. You can look at this is when uh, the 
Irma landing, this is increased uh, the soil, mold, uh, soil moisture, and uh, then generate a total runoff, and uh, eventually thread, uh, river channel generate uh, the stream flow. Okay. And uh, due to the relative less uh, precipitation and also dry soil, this is the uh, Irma uh, causing less severe inland flooding in Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina when, when compared with the Texas Louisiana case. But uh, because our model didn't include the storm search uh, process, this is only considered the uh, precipitation cause of flooding, not uh, include the storm search part, okay? And uh, this shows the different, uh, different uh, soil and the hydrology process impact for soil, mo soil moisture and stream flow. You can look, uh, this shows uh, top one soil moisture percentile. This shows uh, multimodal uh, mean case and this shows NOAA, MOSSET, and WIC. If during the IRMA, you can look at all the is very wet, you drink the wet case, okay? But after nine days, this shows quite different, okay? If you look at the uh, NOAA, almost become the normal or dry case. But if you look at the WIC model, this shows the still is very wet, and the mosaic in between. If you look at the multi ensemble mean, shows the, the re relative uh, wet. This means uh, the different uh, physical process will will affect uh, the your uh, your stream flow calculation, so multi calculation after the Irma. They throw the how many days they just uh, uh, become normal and recovery. This is a still is a challenge for the community. Here I just raised a question. We use a different uh, even field capacity, the root zone depth, and the uh, and the evaporation algorithm and the parameterization and the central is the effect of our result. Okay. And here shows your operational and the real time uh, iron dust, okay, for Irma. This shows the operational precipitation and the stream flow normally, and this is to show you the uh, real time precipitation and anomaly. You can look at either if we use the operational, we have the uh, 40 behind, and then we cannot uh, capture flooding case in time. Okay, but if we use the experimental model, because we use uh, name V4 uh, for, our, for our forecast, this shows some uh, inaccuracy if we compare the uh, observation. Okay, but even so, uh, I think the timing may be more important for real time monitor in the, in the future. Okay. And this slide shows your iron dust and NSAC geodust development and the future plan. We just released our white paper. The white paper shows you about vision requirement and implementation. And you can download from this is the iron dust website. And they basically give the iron dust how to develop from different, different steps and also NSAC geodust. Eventually, we wanted to uni uh, unify two systems into the NSAF unified IRDAS system. This is give some the, the outline. You can check this is the white paper and uh, see we, uh, we how to uh, develop our IRDAS system. The IRDAS development and update will help enhance our air and dust capability for both the drought and the flooding monitoring task. And here I give a summary. The air and dust can monitor many features of flooding caused by hurricanes, Harvey, and Irma. But going to find and grade 
uh, scale, then the current lambdas could provide additional details like uh, national water model go to the one kilometer. Okay, how we brought heavy precipitation over long duration over soil over soils in Texas and uh, Louisiana were relatively wet before landfall. These conditions caused a catastrophic inland flooding. And Irma had a strong wind over the large land area and the less precipitation we compare to the Harvey. And uh, affect the state of Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina had relatively dry soil before landfall, potential mitigating the level of inland flooding as well. And the real-time iron dust does definitely have monitoring flooding situation when compared with the current operational with a four-day delay. And the iron dust development and the upgrade include the addition of data simulation, model physics, and the parameter upgrade and the increase the fine resolution will further enhance its uh, capability to operation monitor drought and flooding occurrence duration and termination. For details, you can see the recent release white paper. On the last slide, I show you the exper experimental real iron product. You can download it from this website for internal uh, look. And also, I show you in experimental real-time iron dust drought monitor. And also, I gave some link in the iron dust website and the iron dust publications. And here shows the, the movie about the stream flow anomaly for the, both the hurricanes Harvey and Irma. I stop here, and now I can take any questions from you. Thanks. Great, thanks a lot, Yulong. That was a really interesting overview of, um, of what NLDAS shows for the event. Um, let's see, there was a question. Okay, I think uh, it's actually more logistical um, about WebEx. Is there a question there? Yeah, Anna Rita. Hi, Yulong. Um, I have a question. I think you commented that the current NLDAS does not account for coastal flooding. Um, I'm wondering whether under uh, the topic of NLDAS development, as it's your last, the last word on your previous last slide, uh, whether there is a way to account on that on, in, you know, as far as future development, for example, as far as data simulation or something else? Yeah, I think the, the data simulation, CRISPR group and our group of view, if you look at the, uh, our white paper, we plan for the after real time upgrade, we will go to NDAS 3. And for the other the coastline and the storm search part, we just wait to the community and the research community if they have the development model and the sub model can easily to incorporate the NDAS, we are happy to transition to operational. Okay, thanks, Yulong. Um, I don't see any other questions online. Anything else in the room here? Um, so there was one question for John that we didn't have time to get to. John, are you still on the line? Yep, I'm still here. Okay, great. So there was a question. Um, the person was wondering whether Hurricane Harvey shared or shares any similarities with Tropical Storm Allison, uh, which also produced a significant amount of rainfall over the Houston area. Yes, the both storms uh, basically stalled once they made landfall. Um, Allison was not the continuous rainfall producer. It was it was it was more of a localized flooding event in part of Houston rather than being the widespread multi-county uh, sort of event that uh, Harvey was. Um, and also, Allison was was occurred in June, so it didn't have as warm. Uh, sea surface temperatures to feed off of and, and load water into the atmosphere that, that Harvey was able to work with. Okay, great. Thanks, John. 
So um, that's it in terms of questions on the line, and um, I think we'll, we'll adjourn at this point. I want to thank the speakers. I know this is a somewhat long webinar, and I appreciate you all hanging on the line. Uh, I thought the talks were really interesting, covered a lot of ground over the last couple hours. Um, for the attendees, I know some folks uh, tried joining earlier. We're having difficulties because we were over capacity for a lot of the webinar. Um, we're going to have the recording and all of the slides that's available on the website probably in the next couple of days. So check back if you want to see other talks or go back and see something um, that, that you were on the line for. And um, I want to put a plug in for the webinar tomorrow, which is going to be focused um, on prediction across timescales. And Heather Archambault is going to host it. And while I have the platform, I just want to say Heather's moving up to GFDL next week. She's leaving Climate Program Office. And I just want to say that it's been really enjoyable to co-host the webinar series with you for the last few years, so thank you for everything you've done, and you get to do one more tomorrow, which is great. Um, and uh, yeah, please check out our website, some of the past webinars, sign up for the email list uh, so you can hear about future webinars. Um, and that's it for me. Again, thanks so much to the speakers for taking the time to present. It was, each of the talks was, was really very interesting, and, and we really appreciate you um, sharing some of your research with us. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Talk to you tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Bye.